The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. Enhance your ASIC education with Foundry's hands-on courses. Led by veteran industry instructors, Foundry's three-day mining intensive and five-day mining technician academy programs cover a range of topics, from identifying issues and troubleshooting common hardware failures to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact. Open to enthusiasts and professionals alike, visit www.foundryacademy.com to learn more and sign up for the course that's right for you. Anthony, welcome back to The Mining Pod. It's been a month since we've seen you. And our last podcast on mining equities actually is one of the highest performing podcasts we've ever had on the show. So I'm thankful to have you back on this morning. Thanks so much for having me. And certainly a lot of fireworks to start off the day. We're recording this on Friday, December 9th. As of right now, we just saw a Bloomberg article point out that there are uh, that there's been the halting of Argo blockchain's uh, mining stock on the London Stock Exchange. So that is definitely some news. There's also been a screenshot circulating social media that uh, Argo blockchain may be filing for Chapter 11 bankruptcy restructuring next Monday uh, on the 12th. So definitely like something to start the show off with. Let's kick off. Just talk about Argo's positioning. We also have their monthly numbers out, uh, but it's definitely some nice context for what's happening. Yeah, um, so this morning at um, about 4.30 UK time, um, a couple of hours earlier than normal, Argo released its uh, monthly mining update. Um, and there's nothing too much untoward with the update. Um, the, the numbers were low, but they've been low for the, like, the last 12 to 18 months now. It's been a struggle for them from production-wise. Uh, they haven't got an agreement in Texas for a fixed uh, price contract, so they're having to um, basically curtail quite regularly when the, when the energy price increases and spikes. So, um, but at uh, 7.45 this morning, as you've already alluded to, um, the London Stock Exchange issued a notice of suspension of Argo shares. And the NASDAQ followed with a suspension on, on, on their exchange as well of Argo shares. Um, and like I say, yesterday, there was, um, that there was an, uh, a notification, maybe put out in error on the website that suggested Argo were about to go into Chapter 11 um, on the 12th of December. Um, so again, still waiting for that to be um, promulgated by the company correctly, but um, some of the sharper uh, uh, shareholders um, saw that and, and copied it and shared it all around social media today. So there's been a hive of activity. Um, in all honesty, we, it's, it's, it's not to be unexpected. I mean, we covered Argo in, in quite a lot of the articles this year and also in, in the podcast that we've done together, Will. Um, you know, I, I mentioned last time in, in last uh, podcast, you know, I, I spoke to Peter earlier on, highlighted their debt position um, during a bear market. You know, they've, they're over 100 million in debt. The payments are 4.2 to 4.3 million a month. It's 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 staggering, and and with the Bitcoin price at the moment, so we just take November, and um, they mined 198 Bitcoin, average price about 17,000, and that that gave them 3.55 million dollars in revenue. That doesn't even cover the loans, and you've got to pay energy, staff salaries, professional fees, um, lots of other costs, and so. You know, we were highlighting this for a few months, so it's 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 not getting any better. Um, again, we don't know what what the outcome might be, but it's it wouldn't surprise me if if they do announce next week they're going into into Chapter Eleven. It's been a shame because they've, they've they've been one of the most popular mining stocks. Um, I did a about six months ago. I I did on on on, um, on my Twitter account um, asking people to sort of vote in who their favourite miner was. And uh, Argo was close to the top of the list. And um, bear in mind, they're the only London, um, based, London, you know, based stock. Um, although they're, you know, they're based in um, Canada and um, in Texas, and they're a very, very popular, very popular stock. Um, so I think we a lot of shareholders disappointed the way things have gone. And yeah, let's, let's hope something can be can be worked out. Uh, they've got a great, great side at Helios, but. Um, You've got to pay the bills in this in this in this day and age. And um, you know, I've said before, if you know, if you if you're not getting enough revenue to cover the bills, the, the end isn't is inevitable. 
And they're not the only minor. They're not the only minor at this point in that position. Yeah, one note to follow up on what you're pointing out. We have an article from Coindesk back in September uh, stating that Argo's margin for mining Bitcoin was dropping uh, quite tremendously from a high of 74% in January of this year down to 20% in August. And that was not only because of Bitcoin price, but because the spot price of natural gas in Texas went up to about $0.09, cents, which was three times the number for the previous year, August of 2021. And as you've mentioned in a few conversations, Argo was one of the most uh, highest margin miners in 2021. But 2022, that was not the case. Helios was delayed. Natural gas prices went up in Texas. They're buying off spot. Bitcoin price went down and difficulty went up. It was just a, a perfect situation for the economics of Bitcoin mining not to work out. So very unfortunate scene there. Any final thoughts on Argo blockchain before we turn to some of the other miners? I mean, yeah, I mean, that their, um, their margin for November was 29%. It had reduced from 32 in October. But if you think back to the recent article I did on, 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 on metrics across five of the largest uh, miners by MCAP, um, but we're achieving 34% margin um, over the period July to September. And Marathon Digital were, were, were achieving 36% over that same period. So even, you know, Argos has, has come down from, like you say, 80s, mid 80s last year, um, down to like around 30%. But well, believe you me, at this this part of the year now, with Bitcoin price of seventeen thousand, most of those miners will be in that sort of thirty to forty percent bracket. You know, set, Ju- July to September, Bitcoin was a little bit higher price than it is at the moment, so they were benefiting from a from a from a better position there. So um, we just have to you know just have to wait and see what, what the outcome is this week if it's, if it's further news. Um, the company themselves have. have, 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 have kept things really quiet, um, which is, you know, compared to last year, we were getting, you know, video updates literally every week from Peter Wall and the team there. Um, you know, it's things have gone full circle in, in 12 months. Well, best of luck to the Argo team. Uh, Chapter 11 bankruptcy is restructuring oftentimes. Doesn't mean the company is going away. And I sure hope that the Argo team is able to keep the company in order and restructure and move forward. There's definitely a lot of miners feeling the pain right now. Uh, Argo among them. Let's move over to a few of the other monthly updates. Again, this is not financial advice. This is just to go through the public available numbers, specifically the Bitcoin numbers, hash rate, hash rate under management, uh, stuff of that nature. So we'll start off with BitFarms, but we'll be going through Hut8, Riot, DMG, CleanSpark, and DigiHost on today's podcast. And a part two of this podcast, we'll go through the remainder of the monthly mining numbers we get from various miners who produce those monthly numbers. So I hand it over to you, Anthony. Let's talk about BitFarms, which put out yet another strong monthly update. Yeah, BitFarms, um, if, you, if you looked at how a miner would put out consistent updates every month, BitFarms is, is the miner to do that. Um, seven of the 11 months this year, it's had the top production by Exahash. And... In November, it was it was no different really. They they've put out a stellar update. They've achieved 453 Bitcoin. Um, that's an average of about 15.1 Bitcoin a day, which is um, a small reduction on what they did in October. They had a good month in October, but there was a little bit of difficulty, and, and there's been obviously um, curtailment um, for again for the miners um, throughout the throughout the month. Um, for their year-to-date Bitcoin production, they're now at 4,672. So if we take December's production and we just had a reduction in difficulty, they're going to achieve 5,000 for the year, which would be a really good target to achieve. Um, and everything's on plan for them to get to their five X hash. They've, they've achieved 4.4 at the moment. So they've got more miners coming online. So they'll get either at five or very close to five. And if it's not at the end of December, I'm sure probably by the end of January, they'll, they'll reach that target. Sorry, the facility at Sherbrook um, is, is, on track to, um, is on track to, to, to grow and, and, and that gained more capacity a month. Hence, they went from 4.1 to 4.4 exahash. So that was, that was the reason for that increase. They've still got um, a hodl of over 1,600 coins with a value of about 28 million. Uh, this month, they sold... Um, 853 coins to a pay for current operational requirements, but but b more importantly they they pay some of their galaxy loan off again, so they're reducing that galaxy loan 
um, literally month by month at the moment. So they paid an extra 6.5 million off that, and they're, they're, they're now down to about 16.5 million owing on that particular thing. So their, their balance sheet is getting better month by month now. Um, and in the analysis I did in my recent article, that they've got a, you know, a, real, a relatively strong balance sheet, albeit they still had about 70 million of, of total debt. But they're doing the right thing. They're paying that debt off. Um, they're mining great production every month, and um, I expect I expect them to come through this through this period. Yeah, three things stick out to me about BitFarms when I look at their monthly updates. One, that they continue to put hash rate online. It might decrease the expected hash rate, the forecast, but it's been the case for many miners out there. Uh, so, second would be that they're working the Argentinian market, which has been difficult to work there. It might find cheaper energy, but then you have to deal with the currency crisis that Argentina seems to run back every few years. And that's noted in this monthly update that they've been having some concerns about being able to operate in that foreign market. And then the third uh, point that bring up is the debt, right? So a lot of these miners have struggled with debt and that's brought them under. So Core Scientific, Argo, we just talked about, Iris Energy just defaulted on an SPV. BitFarm seems to be the rare example where they actually had a lot of debt, uh, over $100 million at one point, but they've been able to whittle it back a little bit at a time uh, and pay off this debt in order to keep moving and staying afloat. And I think that's a nice little case study for how to use debt effectively. Um, we had Ben Gagnon on the podcast here a few weeks ago, and he spoke to that effect saying like, you want to use your capital and you want to use your capital correctly, especially being a public miner. And they seem to be a good example of that amidst uh, a, a showering of teams falling apart because of too much debt on their sheets. Absolutely. Um, and, and I think if I remember right from that podcast, Ben highlighted also some companies will go into dilution too quickly um, because that's another lever they can pull. And there's a real cost to dilution, you know, that the shareholders need to realize, you know, they are diluting their position in the company. So, you know, from a growth perspective, um, as soon as you issue extra shares out, your position becomes, becomes that fractionally smaller. Um, so there is a, there is a balance. Um, and, and I think big farms understand that balance more than most of the miners. And they've navigated through. I mean, you know, this, this 2022 has been a been a been a challenging year for for, for all for all for all miners, you know. And even the ones that you think actually they've held out okay, um, you could argue, you know, those miners have still got all the hodl. That that hodl's worth 25 percent what it was in November last year when Bitcoin price was you know 69 thousand. So it's it's not been it's not been great for all the miners in in many different ways, and that reflects in the the fact that the share prices are down now, literally all the miners are, are sort of down 90% on 52-week highs. Certainly. Let's keep moving along. We have a lot of miners to cover, uh, but congrats to the BitFarms team for continuing to crank out fresh coins month after month. Hut8 is the next one up. We have Hut8 put out another stellar report. The only thing that I'm really questioning or curious about is a problem with a power utility uh, that they're seeking mediation on at the moment but you have more details on that uh, along with like their hash rate yeah so um yeah Hutte issued um an update they've they've mined 238 bitcoin this month with um an average operational hash rate um of just over 2.4 exahash which is which is about 25% down on what their normally normal hash rate is and that's because they've got a problem with Valor's power who's their uh, power provider um, in Ontario, um, and they're going through the, the discussions at the moment to try and get that that resolved. Um, but at the moment, 580 petahash is off offline, um, and hence hence their um, you know that their, their um, performance wasn't wasn't as good as as as, as normal. If you look at um, from a from a per exahash, um, that's achieved like 98, and when you think the likes of Bit farms and DMG and Hive are in that 105, 106. It's about seven or eight percent lower. So even though they've accounted for the lower capacity, they're still producing less less bit farms by about eight percent less than some of the the more the more um, efficient miners. One thing, one, thing, one thing they have got though is obviously they've got the 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 the, the, the hodl, and at the moment now it's you know. Heading towards nine thousand coins, so eight thousand nine hundred twenty-five coins, um, and at today's price of about one hundred and fifty million uh, value. So, 
They haven't got a lot of debt on the balance sheet. They've got 152 million in, in Bitcoin, which they continue to say they're not going to sell. They have been diluting shares. So they chose to dilute shares over this last um, 12 months. And shareholders have been noticing that because, it, you know, when you, when you dilute shares, it, you know, it's, you have to submit, obviously, um, public notifications um, so that shareholders are aware. Um, but they're, they're actually, from a, from a debt position and from a balance sheet position, they've got a very, very strong balance sheet, probably the strongest balance sheet if you were comparing all this, the miners from the, from the same point of view. Um, you know, argue, you know, Wright's got a good balance sheet and they're a much bigger miner and they've got some big facilities and a launcher online. But Hut 8, for the, for, the, for the size they are, they've got a very strong balance sheet. And it, I think I highlighted the fact that their liabilities, um, you know, are covered nine times over their current liabilities. So, you know, something would have to fall off the end of a cliff for, um, for Hut 8 to start struggling, um, you know, in the next, in the next few quarters. And maybe they've got some, you know, uh, positioning where they've got the ability to go in there and um, and get some distressed assets and build up their um, extra hash, which the shareholders want to see. Because I think of all the miners, I think their growth in hash rate has been probably one of the most disappointing. But in, in hindsight, you could argue it's actually been quite sensible because, you know, in times of, of, of bear cycles, um, you don't want to be committing too much unless you've got the resources at hand. Yeah, no, I certainly agree with that. And we have some nice analysis from you on their Q3 numbers. So this goes through the end of September, showing their balance sheet. So current assets, $193 million for HUD-8 and current liabilities, $20 million. So it's a 9.5 ratio there. Uh, you also mentioned here in this article, which you can find in compassmining.io, just go to the content tab. Their net assets are EV ranking and enterprise value. Can you walk that out a little bit? Uh, they showed the lowest enterprise value, which like golf, I am understanding you want a, a lower enterprise value. So it was them and Riot out of the five miners you looked at. Yeah, in, in, in simplistic terms, if you look at what a, a company is valued at by its market capitalization, that's the number of ordinary shares times the market price. So say, for instance, Hutte has a million shares and them shares are worth, you know, um, a, a dollar each. That's a, that's, that means you've got a market cap of a million dollars. The enterprise value takes account of any debt and any cash that the company has. Because if you're buying a company, you're buying everything. You're buying the debts. You're buying the cash and the balance sheet as well. So the enterprise value looks at, you know, it says, right, add the debt back, add the debt back to the market capital. But you can remove the cash because once you've bought it, the cash is yours, but you've still got to service the debt. So in Hut 8's position, they've got a massive HODL, which is unrestricted. That HODL can be turned into cash instantly. So it is a cash and cash equivalent. So when you're buying Hut 8, and I think the market cap um, I, I, from that article in front of you there, Will, it's, um, let me just see. Market cap of um, two hundred thirty. This was at the date of the article two hundred thirty-five million, but they've got one hundred sixty-eight million of cash and cash equivalents. So once you take that away, it means that actually you're only you're effectively only paying one hundred four million for a company that's worth two hundred thirty-five million from a market cap. So you're paying a reduced price. Now the flip side of that is Marathon Digital. So Marathon Digital has a market cap of around 600,000, but because it's got 800 million of debt, if you buy that company for 600 million, you've got, you've got the 800 million debt as well. So effectively, for, for, to buy Mara, you're having to have like effectively 1.4 million if you want to clear the debt. And so that's why the enterprise is really interesting. It really does highlight when, you know, if you're going in to buy a company, which one's the more beneficial to look at? When we looked at, um, then you look at the, the uh, enterprise value divided by the net assets, that gives you a ratio um, whereby you can rank them. And so the lower the, the, lower the, the number, the more, the, the better it is. So in Hutte's perspective, point, put 0 0.31 um, was, 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 was lowest of all those five minors, and Marathon was 2.30. So it just shows, you know, you're buying it. You're you're having to pay two point three 
more than the value of the net assets in the in the company. Uh, does that makes does that make sense to you? Yeah, no, it's definitely like a great article and great way to break down miners uh, amidst all the flame outs we're seeing right now. I think just putting those debts and liabilities next to each other. There are other valuation methods, and so you know, don't take you don't take that one metric on its own. You can also look at things like um, you know um, net profit um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a ratio, um, you know margins, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of the ratios. But but it, but it is an interesting one when you when you're purposely looking at you know whether a company wants to buy another company, what's what's the benefit of buying, and you know and and to highlight, Hut Eight has got so much cash and cash equivalents on the balance sheet, and Marathon's got so much debt, and Core Scientific's got so much debt, and Argo's got so much debt. You know, that's where the problem. That's where the problem lies. And so, you know, if, if you're a new investor coming in here, you'd look at the likes of maybe Riot or Hut Eight, maybe even Hive or Bit Farms. That they've got similar similar enterprise values as well. So, you know, but, but Marathon Digital at the moment is is it, you'd be you'd be probably needed a lot more research before you make any decision on that because it, the numbers on that particular metric don't don't stack up in comparison. If you put Wright and Mara together, who are very similar sized companies from a hash rate perspective, both achieving about seven seven exa hash, you can quite clearly see that you know Wright has got some stronger balance sheet, maybe on a par operationally wise, um, growth wise in miners marathons, got a stronger stronger at the moment stronger runway, but hasn't got all the facilities in place. So you know there's lots of different ways of looking at it. But the enterprise value is quite interesting from the, from a, from a perspective of, of an investor looking at a company to buy. Certainly. Let's keep moving down the stack here. Thank you for the updates on HUD 8 there. Let's talk about Riot. We just talked about it already a little bit, but let's get their monthly update numbers. Also looks very strong. The one headline I do want to bring up is the swap from Brains to another pool. We don't know which. More than likely Foundry, but we don't know. But wanted to shoot that in Yeah, there. no, they, they, they come out with a, I, I would say... Um, a, a, another disappointing update from a from a production perspective, but they did articulate this time um, what some of that was. And we put when we say disappointing, so effectively, Riot would have had to have achieved fifty percent more production than they did to be in the like in the same camp as Bit Farms and Hive and DMG. So they were they were achieving seventy uh, coins per exahash, and and the others were achieving one hundred and five. So you know it's literally an extra 50% on top of their production. Now, 22% of that was because their mining pool, Brains Mining Pool, didn't didn't have as much luck as some of the other pools. And I've mentioned this in previous articles as well. There, you know, there is a luck element to mining, and um, you would expect, you know, if you're if you've got a pool where have they have a significant hash rate, all doing the same calculations to get this to find this number. You would have the sort of like the same expectations of achieving Bitcoin based on your percentage of the total global hash rate. But in this particular month, they had they had a bad month. A few months ago, they had a good month, and so you know you have a good month and you think it's going to be good every month. And this month, um, it was down and down twenty two percent. And um, yes, they've notified that they're, they're they're switching pools, but they haven't determined which pool. Foundry probably could be the most likely one. Um, I've spoken to a number of CEOs on mining pools, and you can actually, with some of the pools, you can actually um, agree a predetermined um, return. So as long as you commit to the hash rate that you're saying you commit to, you effectively guarantee um, a return a return of Bitcoin based on your hash rate. So, you, so, you, so it takes away any of the risk then you know. And Iris Energy is one of those companies that have done that. And... If you think about their production, they're they're on sort of like they're on a par with Hive at the top of the tree. So they've obviously utilised that system really well. Got a really good mining pool. Um, took away the risk because they know what they're going to receive every month based on their but based on their total hash rate as part of the total global hash rate. And that's what you'd expect. But this month was a was a bad month for um, for brains. We had this issue with um, if I remember rightly with. Um, um, is it the Mara Pool or Terra Pool, DMG, and Argo had a few months ago, and it just you know it made their production numbers really really poor. But it was like it seemed like it was a a, a one off, um, 
But yeah, I mean, they, they, they probably made the right decision, move, move to a pool where they get more recognition for the, for the size of the, you know, I mean, effectively, they're probably heading towards 3% of the total global hash rates at the moment, right? So, you know, that's a, that's a big a big chunk. You, you, you'd want to ex- be able to de-risk the expectation and know what you're going to get each month, really. And maybe the new pool does that for them. Um, so from a Bitcoin perspective, they mine 521. It sounds it sounds a good total. It's, you know, um, only um, CleanSpark at the moment have, have, have got more than that total. But when you look at the hash rate, Riot's average hash rate for the month was 7.3 exahash. And CleanSpark's hash rate, average hash rate was 5.3. So CleanSpark managed to mine more Bitcoin with two exahash less in computing power. And that's where you say, you know, that's where you look at the the, uh, the, the, the challenging production numbers of some of these miners. You've got three or four miners at the top there who seem to be able to knock out a really good production, really consistent, taking into account of Bitcoin difficulty. And actually, November was a very balanced month for Bitcoin mining difficulty, it increased 0.01%. So it, it was it was a fraction of 1%. So so nobody can really come out and say Bitcoin difficulty affected my production. It, it was negligible. You know, the previous month we saw 17% in October. We've already seen, I think, December, it's already come down by just over 7%. Um, I'm not sure what the next, what the next um, difficulty level looks like. But that's the biggest drop since... Since China um, basically pulled out of um, or you know ordered them or machines to go offline um, in the country, which was in the middle of um, 2021, so they've got six, nearly six thousand nine hundred coin um, with a value of about nearly 120 million dollars. So they've got quite a good cash balance. They've got a good hodl balance. Um, they've they've also had um, in recent recent weeks approval from the shareholders to increase their share offering and that will enable them to really get to their um, goal of of getting their new site at Corsicana up and running with about 40% capacity all paid for with what we, with what they've done at the moment so that gets that gives them in a, in a really strong position there um, it's a one gigawatt site so that'll be an extra 400, 400 um, um, exahash um, Coming online, sorry, four hundred extra. Sorry, uh, four hundred megawatts coming online. It's certainly a, a lot of hash rate to move pools, and just from a public miner perspective, it does make sense to de-risk that part. And I think that's one thing that public miners and miners in general are learning about the perils of going public. And if you're a Bitcoin miner, you operate on a Bitcoin standard because you have to operate on a ten-minute block period hash rate. You get paid in BTC, right? You're denominated in these things that are in a different currency, but public markets are denominated in USD and public markets expect things to be paid out on a certain schedule in a certain way. So if you have 500 extra hash or 500 pence a hash, or you have you know five extra hash or something like that, you're expected to make a payout congruent with that based on napkin math. That's what public markets are expecting. But if you're in Bitcoin world, you know that luck exists. And if you're on a different payout scheme like brains, then you might be unlucky for a month. So I think there's something to be learned here for a lot of miners. Let's keep moving along and hit the next few miners on our list. Let's talk about DMG and Digihost, two smaller miners that are making some nice strong moves into the bear market. Great to see um, DMG put out a, a really good update. In fact, at the moment, I, I can let you know DMG's has put out from an X hash, uh, from a Bitcoin per X hash, has put out the best update um, so far. We've got about two two more miners to come through. So um, Iris Energy and uh, Core Scientific haven't released their numbers yet, but DMG um, they they had uh, eighty eight Bitcoin um, with an average hash rate of eight hundred and thirty pet hash. So like to show it's quite quite a small miner looking to grow to one X hash by the end of the year, and they've they've just received their September um, delivery of S nineteen XPs, which gave them an extra forty five pet hash. So they're a couple of deliveries behind, and depending on the when those deliveries arrive, they've 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 already paid and bought to one X hash. It's just now based on on deliveries. So Sheldon's got um, he's got things moving there. Okay, they've got no debt on the on the balance sheet. Um, 
their actual, if you look at their stock price over the last 12 months, it hasn't gone down as much as all the other, as all the other shares. So that's, it's got, all shares have gone down a lot, but theirs has gone down the least. So I think theirs is like um, closer to 80% rather than 90%. So, um, and yeah, they've got uh, 389 Bitcoin as a hodl, um, along with some, um, with some cash, and that gives them a, um, a, a you know a total hold value of about six point seven million. So they're, they're managing cash flow well as our DigiHost, and DigiHost had a had a had a reasonable a reasonable not as good as last month. Um, they produce sixty one co- uh, Bitcoin. Um, that's two effectively two a day if you look at the thirty day month. They were achieving two point four a day in October over a thirty one day month. So that's come down a little bit. Their hash rate's been at 650 pet hash now for quite a few months, but they've got um, two um, two sites that hopefully will come online um, during the next quarter, which should give them um, a significant bump. And I'm talking, you know, uh, about another 150% increase in their hash rate. So get them towards 2.2, 2.3 exa hash. Um, and we're getting regular updates from them on, on that on, on those two sites there. Um, so we should we should see them some should see them achievement. They've got no debt on the balance sheet at the moment. Um, they've got some again. They've got a small amount of cash and they've got a small amount of hodl. Um, and I think it's about five and a half million of total cash and cash equivalents there to play with. And they're spending around about slight just slightly more than their than they're actually mining per month. But they've got that buffer zone, so I think they've got enough runway, probably to get them through at least six, seven months next year. And by that time, they'll have increased their hash rate, and then be more Bitcoin produced. So, I think for two small miners, both in good positions, both effectively debt free, and both going playing fairly sensible during this bear period, not 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 going through massively, but growing quite quite nicely. Um, yeah, but DMG um, at the moment number one. Number one for the month. We love to see that. I love to see the growth of some of these smaller miners that they don't have a lot of hash rate under management at the moment, but they're using this moment with dropping ASIC prices and uh, the ability to buy up distressed assets to grow. I think Glean, this is a great transition to Glean Spark. Honestly, this is what they've been doing for a while now. Uh, we've had two podcasts with Clean Spark CEO Zach Bradford over the last three months, sort of highlighting their strategy uh, going into the bear market. They've made a lot of different purchases, more or less uh, dollar cost averaging into ASIC purchases. And they've also picked up some distressed facilities, including a nice one from Moss and most recently. So going to boot it over to you for Clean Spark's monthly updates. What can we learn from them? Well, they they've just continued to set another record again in November. So um, it was I think it was five five hundred fifty three Bitcoin mined in October over a thirty one day month. That's now five hundred and thirty five over a thirty day month. So really good, really good performance. They've actually increased the hash rate from five point one to five point five. So they're already well above their planned strategic hash rate for the end of the year. And that's been helped, as you've alluded to already, by them able to pick up uh, distressed uh, assets. And they also picked up, I think, nearly 3,500 distressed miners um, in a box. It's still in their new boxes from Argo blockchain as well. So that was a good a good call there at about, about $15 a terahash. So that was, um, that was good there. Um, so, yeah, hash rate increased by 8%. They do sell the Bitcoin on a monthly basis to pay for operational um, requirements. Um, so they sold 544, so just slightly more than they they uh, mined, um, and they've got a hold of about 290 Bitcoin um, as at as at the end of the month. So, um, every, you know, every, Clean Spark have, have have impressed me probably more than most of the miners this year. They've had a great uh, 2022. Um, they've they've significantly increased their hash rate. I think I think at the last point it was like. Looked at three hundred percent over the over the uh, year on year now, and um, the only other mine that was close to that is uh, is Iris before it had its it, its default problems. I think they were at four hundred and fifty percent, but they've had to sort of I think they've had to hand back quite a chunk of their mining assets um, back to their um, creditors. But um, yeah, CleanSpark in a good position. The, the only the only thing that I'm questioning now is how do they get to the next level because they've got literally a small amount of hodl. 
um, they won't have a lot of cash on the balance sheet because they've been buying distressed items. And, and, and at the last balance sheet, which is more than three months out of date, there wasn't significant amounts then. So they've got to think hard how they're going to get to. And I think they've got a planned exahash strategy of getting to about 20 exahash by the end of 2023. So they've got to literally go another sort of 300% in growth. And as we know, growth is is very costly from a capital perspective. Um, so it'll be interesting. To, it'll be interesting to watch. But what they've done so far is is uh, nothing less than than, than amazing, really. Um, and they've, they've they've you know obviously been very fortunate at the timing of some of these purchases, where you know miners are having you know real um, issues. And I'm hearing you know some CEOs are getting phone calls on a daily basis from other miners to say you know. We've got things to sell, and you know it is a challenge at the moment with the prices the way they are. And cash, cash is king in this in this um, in environment. Yeah, three thoughts on Clean Spark. Luckily enough, I've had time to talk with that team quite a few times, and have been paying attention to the the headlines at the very least that they've been making. The first thing is that they're an energy first company, so they're founded in 1989, I believe, as an energy company that moved into the Bitcoin mining space. And I think that's allowed them to purchase uh, facilities. That makes sense. So I think they're the Georgia facility has uh, costs around 2.9 cents. Um, so it can correct me on that, but it's it's quite low and that will help them out long-term uh, sp- specifically against some other public miners I've seen where they're in the four to five cent range. Uh, second thing is their S19 XP strategy. Interestingly enough, we haven't seen a lot of headlines about them purchasing and deploying S19 XPs like we have with Marathon or Riot, which have really been leaning into those things. And Zach and I talked on the podcast last time a little bit about XPs, uh, more so offline, just about their strategy with S19J Pros, which are very cheap right now. You can buy one for about $2,000 or about $13 to $19 per tera hash, depending on your order. And that's compared to XPs, which are about $6,000 per unit. So you're, it's a little bit more expensive to deploy XPs. And I think that CleanSpark is of the opinion the minor economics at this moment, as of early December, that it makes more sense to be purchasing up S19 J Pros and deploying those. Uh, the last thing I'd like to point out and actually boot over back to you is the equity part of this, right? So a lot of times uh, these miners, they need to finance things. How are they doing it? Well, CleanSpark seems to be using equity. Uh, and I know that there's also been some questions that you've kicked around to me about how CleanSpark is using its equity for its executives and whatnot. Um, I've talked about it a little bit with Zach on that podcast. I'll also refer people to what he said on that show. I, I, un- I understand about stock compensation and the reason for for giving it is you know, aligning everyone's goals, the goals of the company. But I do have to sit and wonder sometimes at the, at the level of stock compensation that's been issued. Um, and also... The targets, performance targets required to to you know to to um, to achieve that, that that stock compensation, and I did look at you know um, the two directors at CleanSpark. It, it, it's quite quite significant amounts when you compare what these mining CEOs and and, and directors are earning from a, from a salary basis. Um, it, it's it's sometimes bewildering how much and we've, we've we've we discussed you know the likes of marathon last year with the, with you know they they issued 161 million of stock compensation and they only achieved 152 million in revenue for the year um so shareholders do wonder sometimes you know this dilution how it affects them and who's benefiting from it you know i think um you know there should be there should be you know you should you should be paid on performance but also the shareholders want to see where their performance is as well in the share price. And with the share price is 9% lower than they were 12 months ago, I want to see a lot less top compensation on the balance sheet and the, and the, and the income and expenditure to, um, to show that they're actually um, taking note um, of, their, of their share price performance um, and doing everything they can to make sure that they can navigate through this through this bear period and get themselves ready for when things turn and the Bitcoin price starts to rise. But um, there are a few miners that, that don't, that don't, I think high blockchain doesn't issue a great deal of stock compensation. And maybe they, maybe they pay their executives, uh, you know, the, the reasonable rates that that will be the argument that comes back is we're not paying enough to our executives. 
But um, I've discussed this with 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 one or two of the CEOs, and um, you know, the shareholders have put the money into these companies to allow them to do what they need what they need to do to grow, and the shareholders want that return. And we don't want to see big percentage of the company going out to you know um, senior management and executives, um, if if the company's not getting the same return for the shareholders. So it needs to be it needs to be thought through a little bit more. I think. Um, but then again, the shareholders have the opportunity to vote these um, stock compensation uh, pr- proposals out if they get together enough and, and vote. And I know um, it, it, it's, it's happened at Argo Blockchain last year. They tried they tried to give their uh, non-execs a level of stock compensation. The shareholders voted it out. Um, so it, it does, you know, it does happen. But um, it doesn't stop every time I open the. Um, a ten a ten Q to look at the levels of, of some of these um some of these companies like the, what they're paying out. It's it's sometimes it's eye watering. Yeah, it's definitely something to keep an eye on and very interesting at the very least to think about how these stock compensations work uh for the crypto space, which is if you think about it, pretty novel for crypto in general. Uh, a lot of these companies have not been public before and they've been private companies. And so this whole uh disclosure, voting, boards, shareholders in the public space. It's quite new to crypto. So it's an ongoing conversation, not just for miners. I think we can wrap it up there. Again, we're going to have a part two later this week once we have more filings from miners. Anthony, thank you again so much for your diligent research and analysis on these miners. And we'll see you again later in the week. Thanks, Will.